It's good to be here tonight. When I come and do something like this, there's so many thoughts that fill my heart and my mind. Just listening to Ken talk. Uh, as an elder at, our, at the church I attend, I'm mindful of investing into the people. Uh, I function as a shepherd. I'm a lay elder, but I function in that way of a shepherd. So I'm mindful of the care of people. And so I sit here and look at you all, and I'm mindful of you all for the little window I have you all with me tonight. Because I care about you, your heart, where you're going in life, and really your walk with the Lord. And as Ken was talking about the, the anticipation of the return of Christ, I hope that every one of us has a real hunger and anticipation for that. I hope none of us have such a grip on this world that we really are kind of anxious about that. While there's much to be unknown about, there is much to be known and there's much to be celebrated in that, that journey. We uh, in Glendive, Montana, enjoy taking people out on digs. It's a simple process. Any one of you could do it. It's a matter of getting onto the ground. And really, as Ken so wonderfully articulated <laughs> the challenges, what you find is this interesting process of discovery. You find this interesting insight of seeing things that you had not seen before. You get to be reminded of the genuine impact of the flood because we're experiencing and excavating fossils that were buried as a result of the flood. And you get to put your hands on that and you get to, in small ways, touch that and experience that. Once you come into our museum, you would get to see kind of how we complete things. Now, much of what you're seeing there are casts. I will tell you the T-Rex cost us $125,000, so it's not a, an inexpensive cast. But with Ruth and what, we're, what I'm going to be talking about tonight, our goal is over the next couple of years is to get Ruth standing up. And so that hopefully we'll have Ruth standing up and so that you'll come in and you'll see real bone in place at some point in the future. And that's our heart's desire because there's a testimony that's tucked within that and that's so important. Now what I want to do tonight is I want to really deal with the excavation process of Ruth, but I want to touch on two points that I'm going to kind of book in the excavation process with. First of all, I want to talk a little bit about the the locality of the impact of the flood. When we look into Montana, where do we see the particulars of the flood impacting life and how things got buried? And on the back end, we're going to take a deeper look into the, into the, the smallest of parts of the bone. We're going to actually look at collagen in dinosaur bones. And so I want to give you kind of as much of a well-rounded experience as possible tonight. I would say that as we move forward into the evening, I trust that you're not just going to experience getting new information, but that you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you won't just hear me talk about dinosaur fossils, but you'll hear me talk about the declarations of the Word of God and the importance of how it can impact and shape your life and the lives of people around you. Now, when we think about the flood itself, it's important for me that we really anchor our thinking with a biblical foundation. And so much of what I hear and see as I talk to people is they don't really understand what science is, what it can do and what it cannot do. Because so much of science is presented to us today as a, I can know everything and it can answer every question kind of endeavor. Now, science is a really good thing. And I think that we were created from the beginning to be scientists. I believe when we see Adam naming the animals, he is in no small way performing the task of being a scientist. So science is not a secular endeavor. It's a, an endeavor ordained by God Himself. And so when we look at the Scripture here, we're reminded of certain key aspects 
of how the world is unfolded as we look at Genesis 1 through 11 and see that as a literal historic account of the first basically 2,000 years of earth history. We see in the judgment here in Genesis 6, then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I'm about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. And what's beautiful here is within this same context, we see the promise of God, the opportunity for the salvation, if you will, through the flood itself. But I will establish my covenant with you and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you and of every living thing of all flesh. Now I set that before us as just a foundation because when we're thinking about Ruth, we're talking about her being dead as a result of being buried and literally being buried alive. And the reason she is in such a state is because we see here in Scripture. In fact, when we look at Genesis 7, we begin to see a little deeper insight, a deeper impact as to what the flood narrative actually communicates. Genesis 7, we see in verse 11, the floodgate, the fountains of the great deep split open, the floodgates of the sky were opened, and the rain came upon the earth. Verse 12, flood came upon the earth, and the water multiplied. Verse 18, water prevailed and multiplied greatly. Verse 19, water prevailed more and more. All the high mountains under all the heavens were covered. Verse 20, the water prevailed. The mountains were covered. The water prevailed. Verse 24, the water prevailed. Is there a, there's something we can pull from this? Is there a theme that's being rooted in here? What we recognize is the flood itself is a total inundation of the face of the planet, and literally everything was changed. And in many respects, we are still seeing the residuals of that impact of, at that time. But something else as we turn into chapter 8 that's important and really more impactful for where we're going to go tonight is when the flood stopped, the water had to go somewhere, and it also impacted the face of the earth. Genesis 8 says, also the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed and the rain from the sky was restrained and the water receded from the earth going forth and returning and at the end of 150 days the water decreased now the water decreased steadily upon until the 10th month and in the 10th month on the first day of the month the tops of the mountains appeared and so what we're seeing here it's received the floodwaters going down, but for the western part of the United States, what do we have? We have this big, huge mountain chain. We're also seeing the uplift of continental crust in some respects. And we can see that and recognize that as we look at Psalm 104. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters were standing above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder they hurried away in alarm. The mountains went up and the valleys went down. And what happens is we're seeing the description, a historic accounting in the, in the Bible of this vertical displacement of the land masses. Some of it's going up and some of it's going down. We also see this feature going on in the ocean. And that vertical displacement, that vertical transition of sediment is what caused the waters to ultimately return back into the oceans. Now that recreates a great deal of erosion. And that's why we are digging up the fossils that we are. And I'll, get, I'll push into that more in just a moment. But let me introduce you to Ruth. Ruth's not much to look at right here, is she? She is approximately 60 to 65% complete. We're waking, working, working on getting a final bone count that we hope we'll have that by next summer. As you can see, she's jumbled together, and yet there's a lot of articulation. Let me give you another, because we were talking uh, earlier about how do you recognize the bone versus rock in the ground. Well, just so you know, visually, most everything you're seeing that has shape is bone. But part of what 
I have to do, and I have to do if you were to come dig with me, is to help you begin to train your eye to see the distinctions. What you're looking for is you're looking for patterns. You're looking for shapes, particular shapes, curved shapes. You're looking for texture. And as you can see here, you've got long linear pieces. You've got the pattern of the tail down here. Most of what you see that might visually look like rock to you is bone in this picture. Now it's not always this obvious everywhere we go, but you do find a sense of your ability to get your eye trained to look for bone. We take people out on the ranch in the area and we just do a, a walkabout. And we're literally just climbing hills looking for little bits of bone. And some people get it and some people don't. Because we can like, it's right here. And they'll walk up and they'll look and they'll say, where? And I'm like, it's right there. <laughs> So you see those that get it, but some will pick it up more quickly than others. But it's a, but it's a process in which you kind of develop your thinking for that. Now, the first thing we really wanted to do with Ruth is to begin to create a grid. The, the, the box, the wooden box around it is not something we necessarily do. For this instance, we did. But we are striking strings off, uh, creating meter squares, so that we can begin to create a picture, a drawing of what went where. Because what is gonna be so important, our objective in the end is actually to get everything separated, get it all cleaned up, so that when we get ready to put it into a metal frame and stand it up, we're gonna know what went where. And this helps us to have a sense of what went where. We're also creating uh, a bone list to make sure that we've got numbers so we know generally what we have. So we're creating a shopping list for Ruth's skeletons, basically what we're doing here. Now, this is the drawing. My wife did that. She's good with sketching and drawing and things of that nature. You'll see basically this is the same image of the picture you just saw. She is assigning names to different things. As we know, and surprisingly enough, I would say probably 95% of what we've dug up out of the ground, we could tell what it was right away. And you can see the numbers that she's got. And so we have, a, they're called accession numbers. And so this number right here, it, it, she should have a prefix GDFM 23-100.006. And this is Ruth's particular number. And those last three digits are going to be the individual bone numbers. And that just helps us to track what's going on with Ruth. Now as I begin to look at Ruth, there were a few things that struck me that I found that I'm still kind of processing, to be honest with you. Uh, the type of ground that she was in uh, was one of the big things. But some of the things that struck me were that some of her bone, bones were articulated which means that they were in order, like the tail, and some were not articulated. Why is that? In fact, that's a fairly common thing when you have a dinosaur skeleton. Is even if it's reasonably complete, it's very uh, disheveled often. Uh, if you're familiar with Sue, the Tyrannosaurus rex that's at the Field Museum, her skull was actually found underneath her hips. And that's not a typical life position. And so you begin to recognize that something unique's going on. The chest cavity for Ruth was actually laid open. We had one side of a rib cage here, and then over here we had other ribs completely opened up and some of her hips were sticking in between. What I'm, what I'm getting at here is you've got everything kind of together, but it's not always in life position. It, you clearly, she didn't just die, lay down, and get buried. Was this her original burial location? And if it wasn't, what caused her to be moved? And what kept the bones while they were being transported? And I'm going to try to answer some of these questions for you as we go through the evening. But these are some of the initial observations that I was making as I was looking at what was going on with Ruth, the nature of the ground that she was walking or was being excavated from. 
This is an Edmontosaurus. This is from the Denver Museum. They are, will range anywhere from probably 28 to 32 feet in length. They can be eight or nine feet at the hips pretty easily, as you can see here. She's got some pretty good size. Um, I don't want to unpack too much in here, but I'll just say uh, these are tendons, which often we found some tendons, but not in life position. Tendons help kind of keep the backbone rigid so that she's not always having to use her muscles to keep her tail up. There's, this, there's another skeletal picture of her so you can get a general sense of what we're looking at here. She's a duck-billed dinosaur, or you might be familiar with the term hadrosaur. And so she's uh, what would be a bird-hipped dinosaur. Now, within, from the, if I could be evolutionary for a second, not to endorse it, but just to kind of make a point, the Edmontosaur, the duck-billed dinosaurs, are not the ones that they were thought became birds. It's interesting, though, the ones that evolutionists think evolved into birds actually had lizard hips, not bird hips, which is an odd dynamic to make sense of that. We recognize that the hip structures are just unique to each animal, and they're not products of evolutionary uh, time over change, or change over time. Her fossils were found in what's called the late Cretaceous. The Cretaceous rocks are typically assigned a date, a time, 65 million years ago. But that's really just a rock name, and the, and the dates are assigned based on secular perspectives of deep time. We get these questions from time to time. They'll, people will come up to me, how old are these bones? Because they're like, I think you're a young earth creationist, but are you really a young earth creationist and what do you believe? And I go back and say, look, we basically say everything died in the flood, which was about 4,400 years ago. That's our standard because the flood created the fossil record. And it, it, Montessors were first discovered in Drumheller, Canada in 1912. From a genetic standpoint, you can see quite a bit of diversity within their skulls. You see different ones you may be even familiar with, with different uh, variations of the hadrosaurs. They all have a basic uh, platform and then their nasal bridge, the crest on their head. Some of those things can be quite distinct. I believe we're looking at one created kind. So when you read in Genesis chapter 1, the, the dinosaur or animals were created after their kind within the hadrosaur kind. I believe this was one kind of dinosaurs. And genetically speaking, they represented some vast diversity, but they're never going to, they never evolved into another kind of animal. The Shantungosaurus is the second biggest dinosaur that's ever lived. This is the biggest hadrosaur, the duck, biggest duckbill dinosaur that has ever been found. Only the big sauropods are bigger. You can see that T-Rex. T-Rexes are between 40 and 45 feet in length, and you'll see how much bigger in the picture this one is in the back. Ruth is not this big. Now let's make our way to Glendive and begin to think about the flood. As I read the two passages earlier on, we see the part of the flood where the sediment is being brought in and layered out. We see the onset of the flood. And then we see at day 150, God stops those processes. What's going on under the ocean? What's going on, on the land? That begins to calm itself. And now the waters are starting to go down, the valleys are starting to open up, the mountain, mountains are starting to rise, and the waters are now going to begin to run off. Now when we think about that and run off, I've got this black line from top to bottom represents basically the foot of the eastern edge of the Rocky Mountains. The circle is the Colorado Plateau. And so people ask me, why do you have, why do you dig for dinosaur bones here? Now I can give them just a flippant answer and say it's because this is where they are, but, but in reality, it's where they're exposed. It's where they have, the ground has eroded enough, and this is where we've got to begin to think about flood water running off. 
that in all likelihood, there may have been a much larger chunk of the United States that actually had dinosaur fossils in it at one point. But we know when the floodwaters run off on the eastern edge, they're running off basically to the Gulf of Mexico. And so you're having sediment stripped away and fossils within it. And on the western edge of that line, you've got a mountain range coming up. And so the fossils are not going to be preserved and sustained in layered sedimentary ground on the western edge, and they're going to get a lot of washing away on the eastern edge. And so we're just finding them where there are unique exposures. We're in the Hell Creek Formation, which is simply named after a town about three hours north of us in Montana. And it has a particular group of dinosaurs in it. It's, therefore, it gets that name Hell Creek Formation. But there's all other formations across Montana with slight variations of dinosaurs in them. When, we, when I see this roadside geology, and I was reading the introduction here, just to kind of begin to get a secular perspective, because I, I enjoy trying to respond to secular perspectives. Geologists are still a long way from fitting all of the rocks of Montana together in a coherent picture. Nevertheless, we can see enough of the broad outlines to be sure that when all the story of Montana's geology is finally told, it will be a tale of a part continent that remained low, flat, and geologically quiet for a long, a very long time, then got scrambled in a long and grinding collision with the Pacific Ocean. If you're going to listen to that with a critical ear and eye, I mean, I just was sitting there reading, how does something get scrambled over a long period of time? Scrambled to me sounds like a quick activity, but it happened really slowly. This, and so when you think about what this text is telling us, it's assuming that deep time and millions of years is a thing. Even though I think what we see in these kind of liter this kind of literature is they recognize the catastrophic nature of the flood. And so I see this dy dynamic going on as they're describing what they see without having to say the flood. I've taken some classes in geology. I took, basically it's a Geology 101, general geology. It was such a great class. I would come home and tell my wife, now here's old earth, millions of years, slow gradual processes, people, and I would come home and tell my wife, they're talking about the Genesis flood and they don't even know it. Repeatedly. And I was like, this is, I was soaking it all up because I would just take their example and, and interpret it in light of a biblical flood and I think, this really is a good piece of information. Now when you think about Montana as a whole, one of the things that I find intriguing is, first of all, this is a cross-section of Glacier National Park. You see the layers? We have this in Montana, in, uh, where we dig in eastern Montana. Layers only occur as a result of water being present. Anytime if you've been along an interstate where you see a cutout, if you've been out west and you see layers of hills, anytime you see where you can visibly discern stacked stratified layers of material, water has been present. And I'm not talking about running water from a standpoint of like a river. I'm talking about water that is two and three times probably deeper than what you're visually seeing there. And so Glacier would have been underwater at one point. And you see the mountains here, how they're eroded out. That's because the water ran off and began to pull some of the sediment away. And you begin to see these stacked layers of rocks, which tells us that these mountains that are 10,000 feet in elevation in spots like Glacier were once underwater, layered up and lifted up through the water. Remember what we read in Genesis chapter 8, verse 5, just a few minutes ago. What was the first thing that's described that was land that was visible to Noah? The mountains coming through the water. This is what we're seeing here. 
There's another example there. Now when we get down to our area, we're starting to hone in a little tighter for eastern Montana. We are in an area that's called a, an anticline. Geologically, it's like a rock fold. Now, as you can see here, it's a fairly deep pushing up. Again, to get all this folding right here, all of this material still has to be wet and pliable. So you're seeing compressive forces, and this is where we dig, is right up here. And so what we have is a fold in the ground that has been buckled up like a tablecloth. If you were to compress a tablecloth and you've got the up and down of the fabric, the ups are the anticlines. And so we've got a compression that goes up and the top layers that were once covering dinosaur fossils will have been washed away. Again, we're still talking about all of this being underwater. And so this, eventually the water goes away the sediment that holds dinosaur fossils is exposed. See, I could probably go 10 or 20 miles to the west of where I dig right now and go down 1,000 feet, as an example, and probably find dinosaur bones. But they're hard enough to find as it is on the surface without trying to be digging holes in the ground. This is some of what the ground looks like. Remember what I just said about the stratified layers? What caused these stratified layers? This is water. Water. And more water. Here's a little drone footage. Now we're finding fossils typically up in those hills, but Ruth was actually found down below. Let's see here. This right here, that's a tarp. I've not gotten to work on it, I've actually not gotten to see it, but that's a triceratops under the tarp. Now, when we think about the floodwaters running off, and we're starting to get several years past the flood itself, and we're going to begin to start seeing the ground solidify a little bit, and we start seeing large stretches of erosion, these are the hills that I was showing you in the previous pictures. They're on either side. There's the Glendive Creek right here. The Glendive Creek did not create all of this floodplain right here. It's the remnant of what's left over. This is Ruth's spot right here. She's out here in a floodplain. Now, if you know anything about floodplains, and y'all got a lot of flat up here, don't you? I, it looks like flat ground to me up here. Think about when you go further south from here, how much farming is getting done. It's because it's not just because it's flat, but it's because of the unique continual washing in of sediment because water continues to bring rich soil, which makes it good for farming. And so we are seeing a different kind of soil. We're up in here, I'm having to dig through hard rock. Down here, this has been very worked by water many times. Now this is flying in from a different direction towards Ruth. This is our dig site right here. You know what I appreciated about Ruth? Is that she died right by the side of the road right here. I was so thankful for that. <laughs> but uh, it, we have we have a nice flat area. All of this is floodplain area right here. We've walked these areas here. We have a little bit of bone washing out on the backside back here. And what we're hoping is that there actually are multiple skeletons throughout this whole region right here. That if there's one fairly complete skeleton, maybe it's just me being a paleontologist and just Maybe it's the little boy and me just being excited, but I think there's got to be more here, right? Would y'all come and help? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe I get you out there on a, on a perfectly a good temperature day, right? Under Ruth is this kind of ground right here. Uh, the scales, I should have put a scale in here, but these are little pebbles of clay. Uh, you're probably talking ping pong ball to baseball size pieces of clay. And you also see all of this sand. It's very sandy material. 
Now, when you start seeing this sandy material, this tells me that lots of water has come through here probably multiple times through the years. If you go to the beach, that's where we get our sand because the water action keeps breaking up the ground. Here's another picture underneath. Now, I'm still a little suspicious of this red layer right here. We're not sure if it is plant material, but you see the same type of ground right underneath. It was really easy to dig in. So the question I'm asking is, if you remember our early questions, Ruth is fairly articulated and complete, but she's not totally articulated. Her bones have been jumbled around. So I think she actually died somewhere else, but what, is keep, what, but what kept her generally together? I think she's got skin, muscles, tendons, it probably was not yet decayed that was keeping her together. And so what I see with Ruth is that the flood initiation, she would have been inundated completely by water, buried literally alive. She would have been buried fully intact. I don't really see much breakage as if she were uh, slammed into something and there's damage that way. It looks like she was simply inundated by sediment and, and suffocated. Her soft parts would have begun to break down in this initial burial spot, but not fully which remember the, what I'm, the premise I'm working through is I see partial articulation, but I don't see full articulation. Some things are staying together and other things are not staying together. So I would have seen a secondary burial. And what I'm seeing is that the flood buries her in one spot. When the waters begin to run off, she gets picked up again and moved to a new spot. And that's where she dies here. And this is where her sediment or her soft parts will eventually decay completely. And this is where she'll be when we find her. So you want to take a look and see what we did? Let's start with kind of the process. When we deal with bones, we're looking to create a, an aluminum foil and then we take burlap pieces and dip them in plaster and we're trying to create a cast. Now with these bigger bones, we create a pedestal. And as you'll see on the far left right down here, this is just dirt. And picture all of this would have been dirt around the fossil at one point. And we're trying to get it all the way down to this point. And when we get that set up, we wrap her in plaster and then we would work to flip it over and take the bone out. And we're going to start to break bones up one at a time, not break them up, break up the skeleton. These are her lower leg bones. And you'll see what we're doing here is we're creating openings. These are pedestals. And we're trying to keep enough ground under this bone to keep it stable, but not too much. Because what we want to be able to do is oftentimes is wrap plaster completely around. And we just have just loads of burlap bags. We're taking them into strips and making plaster. It can get a little messy at times. We'll start by wrapping one end, wrapping around the end and starting to mold it into the shape of the bone itself. And then as we get further along, if you'll notice the picture on the right, there's a splint, there's a stake that's running right through. We're trying to keep this thing as stable and solid as we can so that when we flip it over and take it out, we've got something that's really uh, strong enough to carry the bone. Because this particular bone, I would say easily was in that 60 to 80 pound range. And some of them were well over 300 pounds. Now when we move up into the hips and the legs and the tail, Dinosaurs are unique. They have what's called a perforated acetabulum. It's where the head of the femur fits into the hip socket. Humans have a closed acetabulum. Basically, uh, the ball of our femur fits into our hip, and this hip is a closed, flat surface that it will fit into. Dinosaurs have an opening. 
they have the convergence of three bones, the pubis, the ischium, and the ilium. And those three bones come together to create an opening which would be filled with cartilage, and then the femur sits into that. Now this is a picture, this is back to the one in Denver again, and you'll see the opening right here. It's kind of tucked in behind the head of the femur, but that's an opening. This is the ischium, that's the pubis bone, and that's the ilium. Of course, there's another set on the other side. And those three converge to make an opening right here where cartilage would sit in and the femur would lock into that. Now the femur on a lot of dinosaurs, particularly the edmontosaur, has what's called a fourth trochanter. The fourth trochanter is this bulge, as you can see, I've got highlighted on the back of the femur. Now when I see something like that, that tells me that something was specifically going on with this. This is just not a random feature. If there was a cancer or some type of damage, we would be able to detect that. This is a designed feature into the animal itself. And this is an attachment point where the tendon would attach to the bone and the tendon's attached to a muscle called a caudal femoralis longus. Now I know that it's gonna flow right off of your tongue, right? <laughs> now the caudal femoralis longus is a muscle with attachment into the back of the femur and it flows into the tail. And when that muscle contracts, it will pull that femur back. In which direction is the animal going? When the femur is pulled back, the animal gets to move forward. And so when that muscle alternates, then it's able to start walking. Uh, they've seen this muscle in crocodilians, where they'll see that same thing, where the, the caudal femoralis longus attaches to the back of the femur and ties into the tail. Now, some of this is interesting because you might think, it's just bones, what can you know about the missing tissue? But stuff like muscles, we can actually see scarring where, bones would have, where muscles and tendons would have attached. We can see the ends of bones where cartilage would have been. It, uh, we can see little holes called foramen where blood vessels would have been. And while you're not seeing in the, on the surface all of these individual soft tissue parts, you actually do get to visualize where they would have been and imply a function. So here's the femur in the ground. I believe Jim Bendewall was with you all last month. This is some video footage from him. He came out and shot some stuff with us. And these are the hips. This is called the sacrum. The sacrum is the combination of the hips I showed you, but it's also uh, these uh, sacral vertebra right here and sacral ribs. How, how difficult is it for us to get the bones out without them falling apart? Trust me, we do think about that. Because I know, as you can see right here, you can see all the fractures. In fact, I, I'm standing here doing fossil prep as I'm talking to you. I'm thinking I would start putting glue here and here and here. So when we're in the field, we're asking the, our, our, the question, how much glue do I want to put in the field to keep things together? How much of it do I think can just stay in place and wrap it? Is it going to just crumble on me? There are some like the velociraptor bones that are very hollow. Uh, they're hollow and very fragile they will just collapse very easily and they, I treat them differently. These right here, as much as you see breakage, they're reasonably stable. So what I need to do at this juncture is make sure that the things are in the position I need them to be in and not so much attached per se. So all of these cracks right here, if things are gonna pretty much stay where they are, I'm good with that and then I'll put them into the plaster jacket because I don't want to over glue, because when I get back to the lab, I'm going to put this stuff together with as much precision as I possibly can. So these larger cracks right here, I'm going to pull that apart, clean right in here, and get a real tight bond right there. And so there's the sacred, just pointing back to that here. And so when we started to do prep work on the sacrum, we started with some really big, uh, tunnels underneath the fossil so we could start wrapping because I because it's a fairly square if it's a long piece then I'm going to deal with it one way but it's fairly square I wanted to be sure that I would wrap plaster strips all the way through and around and underneath 
so I could get it out. Because the goal, remember what we sh I showed you the graphic, the goal is to flip it over. And so we're working through this process right here, and this is, this is our flip of the sacrum. And you trust that when you do that, what you want to see when you get it turned over is you want to be able to see dirt. Because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create a jacket that goes down deep enough that it's below the bone so that when I flip it over, I'm breaking the ground down here, I flip it over, then I can clean off that top layer of dirt. Now I'm looking at the side of the bone that I did not see before. <clears throat> this is one of the ileum, which is part of the uh, perforated acetabulum bones that I was telling you about. Tommy hamming it up just a little bit right there. This right here was one of my favorite sections of bone, was the tail. It was fully articulated, uh, at least in this section right here. I think we've got 14 in total. These right here are the spinous processes, which are gonna be these pieces across the top. These pieces along the bottom are separate bones. They're called chevrons. Uh, they're long and slender, and then they split just at the top, and then they'll tie into the base of the vertebra right here. And that would be all of these longer ones right here. And so we are numbering them. We took this actually out as one jacket rather than break them up in the field. Now, again, thinking that we're going to flip this over, I wanted to be able to manage it as well as I could because I think this one's probably in that 350 pound range. And so I wanted to be able to handle it well. And so we created this wooden box underneath and we plastered it into the jacket itself. So when we flip it over, now it's sitting on a platform. And here's us flipping it over. I'm still bigger and stronger than most all the guys. But at 61, I'm li I like to let the younger guys do as much as they want to. So I don't really, I like, I could probably do that just fine, but you're good, so. We also got into a bit of the skull. The value of it in Montessor can vary depending on what all is available as far as bone. This particular skeleton we were all hoping that there would be a substantial amount of the skull because the heads are just an important part of the animal. As it turned out, there was just this skull cap and, uh, part of, and uh, one of the jaw pieces, the, the mandible. And so that kind of minimized some of our excitement. Here's the jaw piece right here. Here's another picture of it. I have not gotten it out of the jacket yet because it's in several pieces, so I don't know if there's some teeth that are present or not. I would imagine there probably are not any teeth. If there were, it'd be visible right along here. Uh, with duckbill dinosaur, again, the beak would have sat right down here, and there would have been a mirror to this jaw right here. Now, when you think about the jaw, and as I think about the mechanics of how these animals work, because we talked last year about behemoth and we talked about the movement of the sauropods. One of the things that's important all for to remember here is the edmontosaur is the, is the biting process. How did he chew? That's always a big deal for paleontologists. What did he eat? How did he chew his food? And so you begin to picture how the bones would have fit together and then you begin to visualize what muscles would have been in what places. You see the coronoid process right here. Now the hinge point is back here. So when it opens and closes, this is the point at which it moves. So why is this protrusion here? Why is that process in place? Well, this is telling me, like I showed you earlier with the fourth trochanter, that's the point at which muscles would have attached and created some form of contraction. And so what we're seeing, and I've got these two red arrows here, is you're going to have part of the muscles would have tied, tied up into here. The others would have gone behind this jugal, this cheekbone, and gone up into the skull. And it would have served that, that process as a point at which you would have seen contraction 
would have allowed the jaw to close itself. And I've run across this video to kind of give you a, a sense of what, the what that process of chewing might have looked like. Now he's likely with the beak is taking large strips of vegetation and tearing it off. Like the, saur the sauropods, don't, they don't have teeth to chew their food, but the Edmontosaur has teeth to chew its food. And you'll see the slight flexure of the cheeks as he bites in. And you'll see how the teeth slide past one another. This is a, the inside of an Edmontosaur jaw. This is not Ruth. Now what you have here is an, an entire battery of teeth. Each, that's a tooth, that's a tooth, that's a tooth. And each row represents about three or four teeth. Now when you begin to think about how many teeth this animal's got, you're talking hundreds and hundreds of teeth. And they're always growing new teeth. And as you saw in the video, what happens is the teeth are going to slide past one another. Upper and lower jaw are going to slide and shear the vegetation. And what that's going to do is it's going to flatten the teeth. Now, I'm not going to try to hold it up as a visual. I would just encourage you. I've got some Edmontosaur teeth up here if you want to see them afterwards. But one of the things that I've got a lot of small pieces, we pick up a lot of Edmontosaur teeth that are really flat and small and short which tells me that they're, they've been shed from the animal's mouth. So they're at the top, they get to a point when they've been, they've just about gone, the bottom teeth continue to push up and eventually the top ones, top ones will just fall out. And so you're just seeing this entire battery of teeth that work through here. When we go back to the lab, um, still young men keeping them busy, uh, this is the tail section right here, and just wrestling it off. We try to find creative ways to move things um, as best we can. We get as many people to get things taken care of and try not to hurt anybody's back in the process. And everybody, was, nobody got mad at anybody here today either, so that was good. When we get in the lab, if you remember the the tibia and the fibula that we started with in the excavation process. This is them in the lab. And so they're now on the side of the bone that was actually in the ground, and they're starting to clean it off. And we don't take the bone out of the plaster jacket until we're satisfied that it is solid and stable. And we're gonna soak it with glue. This picture right here, you can see the dark Jason's already been putting glue in that. That dark is glue. And so we're going to keep cleaning the dirt off. And you can see how he's darkened it right here. This has got a layer of what we call PVA, polyvinyl acetate, upon it. And that will help kind of stabilize the surface. And this is the process we go through. This right here is still not done, and you could probably have at least another day just prepping those two bones. and smiles when the project is reasonably complete and ready to move on. We go through with our tools when we get to the lab of getting the plaster removed. Uh, we have cast saws, tin snips, whatever we need to get the plaster opened up and so we can get back to the bone and continue to prep and get it out on display. Now, I mentioned early on that we were looking at getting into collagen. We, uh, um, we connected with uh, Brian Thomas back in the summer. He heard we were working on this skeleton. He said, is there any way you can send me some core samples of Ruth? And so we got back to the lab once we got it in, and this is the first time I've ever actually taken a drill to a bone because I'm usually doing kind of just the opposite. And so we were able to provide Brian with some samples. Brian thin sliced them and studied them. We sent them off and he found collagen. Now why is that significant? Well, first of all, Brian has done some work here 
He submitted this paper. I'm not going to try to unpack it for you because I can't. This is a Brian Thomas thing right here. But you can begin to get a sense of the technical part. What I do want to do is I'm going to highlight the conclusion here. Now, this is another Edmontosaur that he did his paper on, but he was telling me he's finding the exact same thing in Ruth that he found in this particular Edmontosaur. And the conclusions he's got here is the biomaterial detected, and the biomaterial is a very generic term for what I might call soft tissue, collagen, red blood cells, blood vessels, anything that's more microscopic inside the bone itself. That's biomaterial. The biomaterial detected is not collagen or it is not in endogenous collagen. He eliminated that. It clearly has collagen. So the question now becomes, is collagen decays at a rate, orders of magnitude slower than artificial decay studies? And what he's saying here is he's been able to calculate by putting, accelerating the decay rates of collagen in a lab today. And what he's seeing is those decay rates are fairly, would create a 100 to 500,000 year complete removal of collagen from dinosaur bones. And so what he's saying here is, all right, there is the option that there's some unknown process, but it's highly unlikely. And so where he is landing is the biomaterial detected as collagen, but it was buried orders of magnitude later, not 65 million years ago, but later than prevailing age assignments for Mesozoic fossils. Now this particular study here and these particular insights are really revolution and revolutionizing how we see dinosaur fossils. This is a video work right here that was done of Ruth. The pink and the blue that should be coming in in just a moment is collagen. Now the way I present it to you is this way. If, if dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago and collagen has at best a lifespan of decaying of 500,000 years, should you ever find collagen in a dinosaur bone if it is 65 million years old? And it's not even close, is it? Now, I'm not suggesting the 100,000 or 500,000 years is a representative number. I'm just forgetting just how they relate to one another. Dr. Kevin Anderson, which I know has been here, has made the comments that as he has looked in to these bones as well to discover this biomaterial, he sees pliable tissue is being found in a variety of dinosaur bones. There's a range of creation ministries that are doing this type of work. Morphologically distinct protein cells are present in this tissue. Collagen fragments are frequently being detected. So what I'm saying is what Brian, what I just showed you with Brian is not an anomaly. It's actually the norm. Other proteins such as actin, myosin, and tubulin are also found. Uh, Mark Armitage has just recently published something where he's finding nerves. Uh, we've got a, he's gone and done a chicken and isolated a, a nerve from a, just going to the grocery store. And then he goes back into a, a triceratops bone and he found, finds identical nerve fibers. When I came across this publication from ACS Publications, they had this to say, and I'm not going to read all of this, but I want to highlight a couple of comments. And I want you to hear how I start and how we finish. Structure similar to blood vessels in location, morphology, flexibility, and transparency have been recovered after demineralization, which is simply just putting them in acid to get the bone away, of multiple dinosaur cortical bone fragments from multiple specimens. And then, of course, they throw in, and some of which are 80 million years old. Going down a little bit, two lines of evidence support this hypothesis that it's literal collagen. First, peptide sequencing of the Brachycephorus uh, blood vessel extracts is consistent with peptides comprising living 
archosaurian blood vessel and is, and is not consistent with a bacterial, cellular, slime mold, or fungal origin. Sometimes I like, should I even read this out loud? Because it seems kind of muddy in their language. But if you just think about what they're saying here is, it's either collagen or some other slimy mess that just came in later. And they're saying, it's not the slimy mess. It's not slime, it's not mold. Second, proteins identified by a mass spectrometry spectrometer uh, can be localized to the tissues using antibodies specific to the proteins, validating their identity. And so what do we see here? Here's a secular publication recognizing the same thing that Brian Thomas is doing and what Mark Armitage is doing, what Kevin Anderson was doing. Uh, ran across this article from Dinosaur DNA talking about the evidence of cartilage cells being found in what they call 75 million year old dinosaur fossils. And sure enough, the staining occurred in the same pattern expected for modern cells. The implications of potentially finding DNA in these samples are huge. Current thinking says that DNA can only persist for about a million years maximum, but these fossils are 75 million years old. This stuff is revolutionizing how we see dinosaur fossils. So why is it relevant to us? First of all, as a young earth creationist, I don't pick that title just because. It's because when I look at Genesis chapters 1 through 11 and take that as literal history and build my chronology on, what I see is an earth that's probably a little over 6,000 years old. Which means that God's word is literal, his historic accounts are true, and science is actually now catching up to validating what the historic narrative has always been saying. You don't need to know the details to know that what this is affirming is that very fact. In fact, I came across this list uh, from Brian Thomas. These are all papers that have been written discovering all of this biomaterial. All of this biomaterial should not last more than 100,000 years, ideally but it's present in dinosaur bones repeatedly. In summary, once viable and living tissue is being found within dinosaur bones, this tissue is still present and in a state of pliability. So we're not talking about fossilized material here. This material is decaying, which means it's not in a stasis state but it means it's once the animal died, it began, began that decay rate, and eventually it would go away completely. While the rate of decay is debated, these rates tell us that this material should be fully decayed within 500,000 years and often within 100,000 years or less. Dinosaurs are thought to have gone extinct 65 million years ago, thus the fossils we excavate are thought to have been in the ground that long. And so when I think about these animals, and I think about the soft tissue that we're seeing, dinosaurs are put before us as proof of Darwinian evolution. And I tell you that they are not proof of Darwinian evolution, because Darwinian evolution is not supported scientifically. They are proof of the unique creation of a creator, God. As simple as this Montessor is right here, when you start to think about with him, if he were to just walk across the field to get a drink of water, all of the systems that have to engage with his eyes being able to see where to go, his hearing, his smell, all of that information, sensory information coming to his brain and his brain beginning to fire down his, down his spinal cord through nerves that actually fire the muscles to contract for him to walk in an eloquent fashion. And as he does so, his heart rate begins to increase. His breathing would begin to increase. The oxygen comes in and comes to the blood. All these systems are complex individually, but they're also complex together. For the Montessor or any dinosaur or any one of us to simply do a basic function in life is meaning that we're reflecting the incredible intricate designed hand of God upon 
all of his creation. 